hello everyone, uh, Ilan Kalapke. Um, first of all, happy International Indigenous Day. Um, I'm really excited to see that so many people are joining this event and conversation. Um, so on behalf of the Center for Environmental and Minority Policy Studies located in uh, Sapporo, Hokkaido in Japan, um, so uh, we're really excited to take part uh, on this collaborative discussion. Um, and so our presentation today focuses on the Ainu, an indigenous people in Japan and, um, and fishing rights. So our presentation um, is divided into uh, two parts. So first I will present some of the historical background and world view of the Ainu to provide a context uh, for Hiroshi um, to dig, dig more into uh, fishing rights and the legal discussion uh, on uh, contemporary development today in Hokkaido. So for those of you, very brief uh, historical background on the Ainu. So the Ainu are an indigenous population in Japan that originally occupied the North uh, Ainu Moshir, currently known as Hokkaido, uh, the northern part of Honshu, the main island in Japan, and Kuril and Southern Sakhalin Island, which are, are now part of uh, Russia. Uh, contact between the Ainu and the Wajin, so ethnically Japanese, can be traced back to at least the 14th century. Um, and ties between times and interaction between um, the two parties grew stronger with more trade exchanges, sometimes conflict. Um, one of the turning points of, of the history um, of the Ainu uh, and the lands, because that's the, the focus of our presentation today, is the Treaty of Shimoda between uh, Russia and Japan in 1854, uh, which was basically aiming at delimiting the territorial boundaries between uh, the two countries. Um, but the, this territory was not yet part of Japan, but it, it, was, uh, it was through this treaty that Japan basically um, um, uh, delimited this, this boundary for the sake of uh, national security concerns. And under this treaty, the Ainu were never consulted nor consented. The second step, a uh, second turning point was the establishment uh, soon after the Meiji restoration of the colonization office in Hokkaido uh, in 1869, which uh, was followed by the development of a system of local commissioners to develop the agriculture and extractive industries um, in Hokkaido. In 1972, the land regulation uh, basically expropriated Ainu of the lands and redistributed the lands among uh, Japanese uh, settlers. And five years later, the forest and wilderness in Hokkaido were declared as state-owned, so basically appropriated as under the dogma, the, the discourse of terra nullius. Uh, the first Ainu policy um, that marked the start like, assimilation, like legal um, assimilation of the Ainu into the Japanese uh, nation is the Foreign Native Protection Act in 1899, uh, which mandated the replacement of Ainu culture, hunting, gathering practices with agriculture, but also the replacement of Ainu names with Japanese name, the ban on uh, women's tattoos um, and, and uh, cultural practices. So basically from that time on, Ainu practices and, and traditional ceremony went underground. They did not disappear, but went underground or were performed into uh, the private sphere. Um, following the implementation of the act, Ainu people were relocated into reservation designated by the Japanese government, which was basically meant to control and use the fertile lands for agriculture. So it was really in this process of agriculturalization, uh, development of the island of Hokkaido. So it's interesting to note that many uh, Ainu villages today in contemporary Hokkaido or Kotan uh, are actually creation by state policy. So um, uh, by relocating uh, Ainu into uh, fertile land, um, it is reported that many Ainu, Ainu face starvation in addition to being deprived of practices that were central to um, their culture and uh, livelihood. Um, following uh, in the process of assimilation colonization, said Japanese settlers use guns to hunt animals for commercial purposes, which caused a sharp decrease in the number of animal population. And in response to this drop in animal population, the Japanese government passed laws to regulate the number of animals that could be taken, but did not acknowledge any special rights for the Ainu. 
And related to salmon fishing, um, there was also the privatization of salmon fishing areas and the regulation of fishing uh, with uh, notably the 1879 law that made nighttime fishing of cherry and chum salmon illegal, which was a practice central to uh, Ainu uh, salmon fishing. Um, then I'm gonna spend uh, some time on the, on, on Ainu world use because I think it's really important to understand how, you know, understanding the issue of fishing um, and land colonization through the, 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 the framework of, of the Ainu really uh, provides a way, a, a counter logic to state policy and, and hegemonic narratives um, and also provides an alternative way of seeing um, the world uh, than what dominant frameworks and discourses uh, usually uh, tell us. So um, as many indigenous population, um, the Ainu had a different conceptualization of the lands, which was not based on ownership and exploitation. And in Ainu uh, worldview, um, the Kamui is the really central uh, central component. So Kamui is uh, a term that refers to supernatural beings uh, with spiritual power or divine nature. Um, and I knew, and for the I knew, can we can manifest in various entities such as plants, animals, but also weather conditions and geography. But if we try to uh, examine more carefully uh, Ainu worldview, we can understand that uh, Kamui does not manifest or uh, is not everything in nature. Um, for example, the bear designates a Kamui itself, but the salmon is not regarded as a Kamui, but as the a fish sent from the divine world. So um, in Ainu worldviews, and animals allow themselves to be hunted to provide subsistence for the Ainu. And the Ainu in turn liberated the souls of Kamui spirits by harvesting those animals. Each village was also expected to cultivate reciprocal relations with local Kamui spirits through ceremony like Yomante and exercising a restraint in their hands. So here we can understand that the relationship between the Ainu, Kamui and the natural world was really like specially oriented and locally grounded. Um, and it was based on this, uh, I think Jeff Kornstein was talking about this idea of relation relationality uh, with the land, which is really important that, um, to, to understand how uh, the importance of the land and uh, for, and, and, and the land and, and um, uh, for Ainu culture and, and, and livelihood. Um, so, yeah, so um, also related to the land, so Ivor zone, so Ainu traditional living space, was also perceived not to belong to Ainu, but to Camry. And um, Ainu living close to um, uh, rivers uh, was uh, the location of the villages was also determined by salmon spawning area. So um, the, the lifestyle and the organization of Ainu communities was really based on nature observation and our relationality with animals um, and the natural environment. So here we can understand, this is a very brief introduction to Ainu worldview, but I think we can understand how the dispossession of Ainu lands uh, altered the relationship between the Ainu uh, and the culture and the organization of the community um, and um, how it uh, disrupted the balance and relational practice upon which they were grounded. I just wanted to read this short passage from uh, the book Our Land Was a Forest, an Ainu memoir, uh, written by Kaino Shigeru. Kaino Shigeru um, is uh, one of the last uh, native, uh, native speaker of Ainu language. Um, and his experience is really interesting because in his books, he describes the process through which he first rejected his Ainu heritage to come to embrace it and to um, engage in, in practices and um, politics, you know, to um, transfer to, to, to transfer, to engage in the process of legacy, of transferring some legacies to next generations. Um, and I think this passage really shows also how the confrontation between Ainu traditional worldviews with a different logic by um, state uh, colonial uh, policies. So he writes, ignoring the ways of the Ainu who had formulated hunting and wooden cutting practices in accordance with the cycles of nature, the chameau, or the, the people coming from the Japanese mainland, um, the chameau came up with arbitrary laws that led to the destruction of the beautiful woods of Nibutani for the profit of the nation of Japan and the corporate giants. With this, half of the Nibutani region ceased to be a land of natural bounty. 
Um, so this is a very, so in his book, he described this question. I think it's really interesting to, to look at, at the issue of, of uh, colonization through uh, the, the lens of, uh, of an Ainu um, perspective. So um, now on land rights today, um, there are two important uh, acts that were, that were um, in, uh, established in recent years. So in 1997, the Ainu Cultural Promotion Act replaced the formulative uh, act um, and it focuses on the promotion of Ainu culture, albeit uh, with a very narrow understanding of culture based only on songs, uh, dance and crafts. Um, and it, uh, but it, at the same time, it kind of depoliticized completely Ainu issues. So um, this is a very problematic for um, today uh, right claims. In 2009, uh, we have the Ainu Promotion Act, which was based on a non-binding 2008 resolution, which legally recognized the Ainu as indigenous people for the first time in Japan. So this is a really important act, but at the same time, it is encoded in the legacy of Ainu Cultural Promotion Act um, and this focus on Ainu culture at the expense of political rights. Or, um, and so Nomura Gishi, uh, who uh, was the former director of Ainu Association in Hokkaido uh, said in a speech at the UN General Assembly, fishing became poaching and cutting wood is in the hill was branded as theft. This also shows how, you know, adopting the colonial state logic, Ainu action and practices became defined in a different ways. So today, in theory, Ainu can fish for cultural reasons based on the permission granted by prefectural authority. But as I said, because culture is defined so narrowly, and it's still uh, the go Japanese government who owns the authority and who can give grant permission to Ainu uh, to um, engage in, uh, in, in fishing, for example, uh, it greatly limits the exercise of fishing rights like uh, he or she will be talking about. Um, so just to conclude this part, we could say that, you know, the conceptualization of natural resources based on the exchange values and, and commodification really perpetuates the Korean logic. So when we look at fishing rights and fishing issues in Hokkaido, we should try to shift our, our, the frameworks which we approach this is, issue to um, look at how indigenous uh, Ainu, uh, indigenous perspective understand um, the action. So Hiroshi. If you want to continue. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, first of all, uh, th thank you, uh, Fugu, uh, for for inviting us to your uh, very important uh, workshop. Uh, we, we are very honored uh, to be a part of. Uh, uh, this workshop. I, I, will, I will continue our, our presentation uh, after uh, Eleonora. Uh, my name is Hiroshi Maruyama, and uh, the uh, director of Sempos, Center for Environmental and, and Minority Policy Studies. Uh, my presentation is just briefly outlines the, the, the Ainu fishing rights with a special focus on uh, revered Ainu activist who has uh, taken the lead in struggling for the restoration of their fishing rights. The Ainu activist's name is Satoshi Hatakeyama, a chairperson of the Mombetsu Ainu Association. We call him uh, Hatakeyama Egashi with respect uh, Ekashi is a uh, is, uh, uh, honorific uh, title in the in the Ainu language given to a uh, revered Ainu elder. Uh, Mombes is a small uh, city facing the Sea of Ohotsk uh, in the northern part of Hokkaido. His ancestors had, had made uh, a living by fishing and whaling. Uh, from time immemorial, as archaeological sites suggest. He inaugurated the campaign for the Ainu fishing rights shortly after the 2007 uh, adoption of the UN DRIP. He submitted a petition 
for their right to fish salmon in rivers to the governor of Hokkaido multiple times, but uh, did not receive any response. In September uh, 2018, he openly attempted to fish salmon in the, in the Mo Mobetz River for the Mobetz Ain Association's annual uh, ritual of welcoming salmon back to the river, uh, which is called Kamui Chep on Me. It was, uh, it, it was obstructed by the, by the Hokkaido police uh, building on the audience. Uh, you, you can see a, a photo uh, late, later. Uh, on the 1st of September uh, 2019, Hatakeyama Ekashi uh, fished salmon, regardless of uh, a warning from the Hokkaido authorities concerned. The Hokkaido police immediately investigated him and his colleague on suspicion of poaching, presenting their findings to the Asahikawa uh, district, district Public uh, Prosecutor's Office. In June 2020, the uh, prosecutor's office decided not to uh, prosecute Hatakeyama Ekashi, much to his disappointment. And you, you can see you can see what happened to him on the on the next uh, PowerPoint slide. Eleonora, can can you can you show? No. Hmm? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, you you can see what happened to him and the other Aino Association after uh, fishing some without permission in September uh, twenty nineteen. And uh, you, you can see uh, Hatake Mekashi on the on on, um, on, on the on the left uh, on the left, and uh, you, you can see uh, him uh, in hospital on on the on the right, uh, which was taken uh, uh, last last year. In order to support uh, Hatake Mekashi, we, the Sempos, has organized seminars, held uh, press uh, conferences, and uh, can, 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 can you move on to the next uh, slide? Uh, thank you. And, and uh, uh, written articles and UN submissions condemning the Hokkaido government for trying to criminalize him, referring to the outdated ordinance. As uh, you, you, you can see on the next or next, uh, yeah, uh, these are uh, uh, press conferences. On, on the left, uh, yeah, on the left, uh, Oh, uh, it, it was it was held by us, Atakemekas and me, and uh, on on the light, uh, it, it was it was uh, held uh, by the governor of Hokkaido, and uh, uh, yeah. So 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 you can you can see how uh, uh, outdated. Uh, the 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 ordinance of the Hokkaido uh, Hokkaido government uh, is on the on the next slide. E Eleonora, can you can you move? On? Yes, thank you. So uh, so regarding uh, the uh, legal discussion of the iron fishing rights, uh, you you can see how and uh, why the ordinance is outdated here, uh, but to, to save uh, time, uh, I have to skip uh, the, I, have to, uh, I, I, I can't go into the detail, uh, uh, de details. And uh, 
So la lastly, I will I will show you our uh, concluding our con concluding remarks. Yes, and uh, these. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, these are these are our uh, con concluding remarks. Um, uh, I, I have to stop. Oh, okay, okay. So, uh, so yeah, Eleanor, so yeah, go, go ahead. Concluding concluding yeah. remarks. So we just wanted to highlight in this presentation how okay, you know okay. there's there's um uh like similarity like in the case of Aino in Japan and indigenous people in Japan is has presented some similarities with um other indigenous people so 100 years of colonization assimilation policy but there's also um some specific um things that are you know specific to the context of japan for example the the late recognition of the indigenous status of the Ainu uh, so in 2008 but it was a non-binding declaration and the law in 2019 and the japanese government has also never acknowledged uh, colonial history or its colonial past so there was never um any um apologies, you know, a recognition of the suffering uh, of the Ainu. So that's something that um, is very important to, to understand in the Japanese context. And we uh, also wanted to focus on rights because in Japan, international forums and the use of a rights-based discourse provided important leverage for the Ainu to achieve recognition in 2008 and also 2019. So um, really mobilizing the UN forums, um, international events that were happening in Japan uh, and international actors really provided uh, impulses, you know, for the advancement of Ainu uh, cause. And the case of fishing rights, it exhibits some forms of self-determination and protection, uh, attempt to protect Ainu lands and waters, but it encounters also state, colonial state policy. Um, so it shows really how acts of resurgence uh, encored in the context of a settler state really uh, face, you know, some, some limitation. But at the same time, you know, we find that um, despite the fact that policy development in Japan still uh, shows re really colonialist attitudes towards the Ainu, uh, this presentation still, I hope, highlighted some of the importance of both individual and collective resistance uh, seeking to maintain and promote Ainu worldview and practices, uh, which uh, we believe has the potential to question and challenge uh, the state logic and dominant narrative. So thank you for your attention. Um, I don't know if anyone has questions uh, about this this presentation. Yes, thank you, Eleanor, and thank you, Hiroshi. Uh, I know people is the latest one to be officially recognized by the government. And without uh, the full implementation of rights of inter people, is everywhere. So we are keen to uh, learn the future development of your subjects and beyond. I I, I would look for that there's some question. There's a question. Yeah. You, you can see it from the chat. Yeah, so has the 2019 recognition of the Ainu as indigenous brought some concrete changes to the Ainu, uh, such as related to fishing rights, other cultural and territorial rights? So I think that it's a bit too early to assess uh, the extent of uh, the changes brought by uh, the 2019 recognition of the Ainu. Um, what we can say is that, is that um, it's still really focused on culture, tourists, um, based uh, promotion. So in that sense, it's, it continues a bit this discourses that the Ainu um, is, a, is only a cultural issue. And, and it's still, for me, there's still this issue of no political discussion, no politicization really of uh, Ainu issues. Um, so it has not, I wouldn't, I think it, it hasn't brought like political changes. Although for me, I think that um, the fact that the Ainu now has a legal status as indigenous people in Japan, um, legal lawsuit, for example, uh, about fishing rights, it can provide, you know, a stronger basis um, to demand rights. But I think that, you know, we should wait the development in, in the next uh, next years to see the extent to which this new legal status can really uh, bring some change for the Ainu. But I think there's, there's a lot of challenges, you know, um, that still uh, that are still explained by the policy legacy focused on culture. 
Yeah, thank you for the question. And the more will be uh, can, can be uh, shared uh, in our uh, last session, open interaction.